Okay, so hi, welcome to the talk. My name is Avi Lachmish. Uh, we are going to talk a bit about uh, algorithm complexity, data locality, parallelism, uh, compiler optimization, uh, uh, and all of that in the context of how the hardware is running that. So as I said, my name is Avi Lachmish. I'm working for Incredibuild. I've been dealing with C++ for a very long time. I'm part of the Israeli national body. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of software do you develop. And uh, at the end of the day, it will run on the hardware that you are actually running it. So you should care about the hardware and understand the hardware and its impact on your efficiency. So let's take an example. Let's say that we have two matrices. One of them we are running row by row, by row and the other one we are dealing it column by column. We are actually doing the same, the same kind of work, right? Let's say we are taking the, the, the each element and we are summing it, and at the end we want a result. So let's see an example. So we actually have here two matrices. Uh, the size of them is 4,096 on 4,096. One of them we are traversing row by row. The other one we are traversing them column by column. Actually, the code looks pretty much the same. The all difference is the way that we are dealing with the loops. And on the main, all that we are doing is actually trying to calculate the sum and at the end we print it, once with the row by row and once with column by column, and we measure time. <clears throat> so let's run it row by row. We can see that the time it took us is about 21 milliseconds. Yep, try to at least. Better? And now we are running it column by column, and we can see the difference in times. One of them is run, ran for 21 milliseconds, the other one ran for 912 milliseconds. And that's our results. So, oops, so. So let's understand why. So in order to understand why, we need to understand it better about the caches. So caches are a fair amount of small memories, but very fast. They are usually holding the, the, the last uh, access data. We have three types of uh, caches in our CPUs. We have the data cache, which holds data. We have the instruction cache, which holds instructions. And we have the TLB. The TLB is actually, actually doing the translation between virtual memory and access physical memory. We are not going to discuss TLB anymore in this talk. The reason for that is that usually when you are taking the, the right approach with data instruction and uh, with data and instructions, you are achieving the same result on the TLB. <coughs> in my machine, we have, uh, uh, I have an i7-10 family processor which holds uh, L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache. Uh, on the size of 32 kilobyte. Uh, we have 256 kilobyte of layer two cache, which holds both instructions and data, and eight megabyte of uh, last layer cache, which holds both instruction and data. So, just to show you. I don't know how you see it. You see it? This is my machine. There is also an associativity that we're going to talk a bit about in the next of the lecture, but the sizes are here. <clears throat> so this is the same, but in a picture. We can see here that each processor has a core, two, two main threads that can run on, on uh, each core, 
each of them can access layer one instruction cache, layer one uh, data cache, and uh, if it doesn't find there, then it goes to the layer two cache, and if it doesn't find there, then it goes to the layer three cache, and if it doesn't find there, it goes to the main memory. <clears throat> uh, the latency on my machine is for the layer one cache is two, between two to four cycles. Uh, depends if you're doing read or write. Uh, for the layer two, latency is about 10 cycles. The layer three is about 40 cycles. And the main memory is about 100 cycles. So the important thing to take out of this uh, is that the main memory is much slower than the, the layer one cache. It's about, in my machine, it's about between 50 to, to 25 times slower. More than that, if you analyze your, your uh, program, uh, you would see that uh, when you are fetching something from the memory, it looks like the CPU is utilized. So you need to profile it very well in order to understand that what it does is fetching data from memory. Let's look in the cache model. So there are three types of cache models that I would like to discuss. On the left, you could see uh, the main memory. On the right, you could see the cache. The main memory, uh, the, the cache will fetch lines each time uh, that it needs from the main memory. It means that each time you're trying to read or write a single byte, you will actually read or write a line. In this example, the line size is four. <coughs> The cache size is 32, bi uh, 32 bytes, and the W, which represents the address bits, in my machine, 64 bits. Okay? A direct cache means that each line in the main memory can reside only on one place on the cache. A fully associative cache means that each line in the main memory can reside anywhere in the cache. Now, there are drawbacks and uh, pawns for each approach. <clears throat> the fully associative cache means that we, you would have to look for the right line in all of the cache. And the direct means that if two lines are supposed to be in the same place in the cache, they will evict each other. So we compromise on a way that will be a, an associative way. What does it mean? It means that in my example here, every red line can fit on that specific set, okay? So each cache has two lines that can be written to the same, to, to the same set. And there is ways to, to calculate how many bits do we need to utilize for the offset, set, and tag. The offset means where are you in the line. The set means to which set uh, uh, we should put the line, and the tag are the rest of the bits that will tell you exactly in the set where is the right line. So cache lines. Cache lines, in my machine, a cache line is a 64 bytes. Uh, cache lines are the, 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 the currency that moves between your caches and, and, uh, and your main memory. The cache line on my machine is the same on layer one, layer two, layer three, and the main memory. Cache line is not that big. So just to get the, the size of it, the, the understanding of the size of it, it's like 16 uh, values of 32 uh, bits or eight values of 64 bits, etc. So now we can explain the, why, why the, the, the difference between uh, traversing it row by row and column by column it's actually because of locality. Let's say that we are traversing it row by row. It means that the first element that we have tried to reach was a cache miss. Uh, we, we fetch it from a memory. And then the next elements were already in the cache. <clears throat> On the column by column, it means for the first element that we have a cache miss, then the second element is also a cache miss, and so forth. Now, since I've been using a very large matrix, 4,096 doubles, it means that when we are going back for the first line for the second element, then the second element will no longer be in the cache. So it will be a cache miss again and again and again. So let's see that. 
<coughs> so this is the column by column. Sorry for that. I'm running here Valgrin. I would prefer to use uh, perf, but uh, I'm using WSL2, and it doesn't really know how to read the counters from the CPU. So I've been using Valgrin for this demonstration with the, the right tool for analyzing the cache. And you could see here that the D1 miss rate is 12.5%. Now, if we are doing that the same with row by row, <coughs> Now you can see that the uh, miss rate is 2.10%, okay? So this explains the, the difference. More than that, there is the prefetcher. If we are moving on the data on the, on the way that the prefetcher can predict, then we can expect that even though we haven't accessed the data yet, the CPU knows that he needs to prefetch that data from the main memory into the cache, such that when we will access it, it will already be in the cache. Okay, so uh, dealing with data in a predictive way, it doesn't mean that we need to go forward or backward in a way that the CPU can predict our steps is very meaningful. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Locality is very important. Locality can be considered to be a special locality and temporal locality. Special locality means that if you are accessing a certain element, then you probably need the next element pretty soon. And temporal locality means that if you access a certain element, then <coughs> you will need the, the same element pretty soon again. And predictability is very important as well. So if you want to write cache-friendly software, you probably Better, the CPU would love to have a continuous memory, like a vector or an array. So if you are using an algorithm that is using a short amount of elements, then you're probably better doing a linear search than a binary search tree, or a binary search tree better than looking it in a hash. That's all okay if the n is not big, because if the n is big, the number of elements is big, then the, the computer science kick, kick in again and the, all the algorithms that we've learned uh, giving sense again. So let's talk about four types of cache misses. There is the cold miss. Cold miss means that this is the first time you are accessing the data. This type of misses you can't really avoid. There is the capacity miss. The capacity miss means that even if you would have a fully associative cache, you would still need to evict something in order to put your data, and then you would need that something that you just evicted, okay? So your cache is really full. There is the conflict miss, which means that only the set, only one set is full, okay? So in a fully associative cache, it will be all right. You, you won't evict the right data. There is the sharing miss. The sharing miss is in the context of parallelism. Now, let's say you have two threads, okay, that are accessing the same cache line. Now, if they are accessing the same cache line and they are accessing the same data, it is called true sharing. And if you are accessing the, the same cache line but different resources, then this one is called false sharing. True sharing is data race. We know what's data race. We know how to avoid it. We could use mutexes, atomics. We've learned a lot about that. False sharing means that from the programming model, you don't have really anything to do with it. It's the hardware problem. But the hardware does guarantee, cache coherency does guarantee that you would get the right result, but it doesn't guarantee the time. So actually, if you have two threads that are accessed by two processors and they're both accessing the same cache line, and one of them at least is writing, then 
the one that is writing will invalidate the, the cache line, and therefore, when the other thread will waken up and will try to, to access his data, he will need to fetch it from main memory. Okay? Let's look an on an example of cache miss. So let's say, again, that I'm having a, an array of 4,096 elements of doubles on 4,096 uh, uh, rows. So each, ro each row will have uh, 2 to the power of 15 bytes. That's because 4,096 is 2 to the power of 12, and a double is 2 to the power of 3. So that's a, that's a line. That's a line size. Now, my assumption is that my machine has a 64 bytes, uh, sorry, a 64 bit uh, address size. It has L1 for data cache in the size of 32 kilobytes, as I showed you. Each line is 64 bytes. And we have an eight way associative cache. So the offset is 6 bit, the set is also 6 bit. And the tag is 52 bits. Now, let's say I would like to take a submatrix, okay, that's really common in the divide and conquer algorithms. Let's say that I want to look at the submatrix on the big matrix and I want to go column by column. Now, the first element, let's say that its address is x, so the second one is x plus two, uh, 2 to the power 15 and so forth. So can you tell me which bits are changed in, in, in each iteration? The tag, the set, or the offset? It's the tag. Why is that it's the tag? Because each time we are incrementing 2 to the power of 15. So we are incrementing 15 bits, right? So log of 2 to the power of 15 is 15 bits. So we are changing the tag each time. So what does it mean? It means that each time that we are iterating the next element, we are putting it to the same set, okay? So iterating on 32 values on a K that is equal to eight means that once we are looking for the first element, it would be a cache miss. Then we are going to the second element, which will be a cache miss. Then we are going to the eighth element, which will also be a cache miss, and then we are when we are accessing the ninth element, we will need to evict something from that specific set, okay? So this is a conflict miss. Let me show you an example of that as well. <coughs> so, Actually, what we are doing here is, well, can't see. I'm taking a matrix of 4,096 on 4,096 doubles. And this is the approach of how do I do uh, uh, the good approach, which I will discuss in a second. But this is the bad approach. The bad approach means that we are traversing it. 32 by 32, but the size of our array is 4096 on 4096. By the way, I didn't say, how would you solve this? So there are two good techniques to solve it. The first one, you could pad the big array such that you, it will change the set, okay? And the second approach will be just copy the 32 bytes the, the 32 uh, submatrix into your own place and do your math there. And therefore, the, the old matrix will fit the cache and there will be no cache misses. So, in a way, I've just explained to you the code. So let's see it's run. So, this one is that when I'm using the bad approach, and this one is when I'm doing the good approach. It won't be that much of a time, but let's see, but that's because I'm doing it only once. But let's see the cache misses. 
So this one doesn't do a copy. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yes, I can. So you can see here the cache misses are 44%, and this one that is doing the copy This one that is doing the copy, you can see here that it has a miss of uh, less than 1%. Okay, so let's talk a bit about false sharing. False sharing means that we have two threads that are accessing different resources, but actually on the same cache line, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's say that one of them is writing, then it invalidates the other one, right? So when the other one would, would want to read or write, then it will need to fetch it back from main memory, even though they are not the same resources. So we will get the right result, but not on the same time. So solving that also could be by aligning the, the, the resources <coughs> um, and Usually, for, for, for false sharing, we don't have a, a very good result or a very good tool that can, 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 uh, can teach you how to write a good code because actually we are really depending on the compiler. Uh, let's, say, let's say that we have two uh, globals. How do we know how do they lay out in, 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 the, in memory? Okay, so you need to see that even though you're increasing your number of threads, your performance doesn't uh, uh, increase as well, and therefore you should ask yourself if you are having a false sharing issue. Let's talk a bit about the prefetcher. So the prefetcher, what I've done here, I took an array of 100 million integers, and once I've just sequential uh, run, run, run on them in a sequential way. On the stride example, I took the first element and then the 16 element and then the 32 element, but at the end, I've ran back and I took the first element, the 17 element, so I did the same amount of job, the same amount of work in each case, okay? But the results are very different. The efficiency results are very different. And the last example, I've ran a random access the same amount of iteration, but a random access, and I got a very different result. So for the random access, we can explain it by now. It is mainly because the, we didn't give the prefetcher any way to predict, right? It, it didn't uh, fetch uh, the, the cache line in time, and therefore we got a very bad result. But why did we get that for the stride example? Yeah, but the prefetcher could, could fetch me in time the next line. So the, the main reason is that you are not utilizing your, your cache line. Once you're fetching something into memory, you should utilize it, right? Because if you are utilizing, if you are fetching a cache line, you should utilize all its number. The reason for that in that example is that once we get back to the first element, after we do the full stride iteration, get to the second, uh, the second run, then it was no longer in cache. So in that, we paid there. We paid there on a cache miss. <clears throat> so I've done a few examples. I've ran a full sequential run, a stride run, a different stride runs, and I got different results that are shown here. So the, the main thing that I would like to take out of that is that if you are fetching something into memory, then utilize it. So let's look at an example. So uh, I'm having here a shape uh, and, uh, and the circle that is actually inherited from a shape. 
and a square is, which is actually inheriting from a shape as well. And we have a button that has a, a unique pointer and a label. What's bad with this program is that we are accessing the data through a pointer. And a pointer should be considered as a cache miss. So how do we solve it with C++? When we can, we should do that. Why? Because then the cache line will be ordered better for us. In this example, I'm having a structure which has an ID and data which is, let's consider it, a big data. And all I want to do is just find if on the, on the structure and look for something that is equal to my ID. But each time I'm fetching something, I'm fetching my data to the cache. And when I'm doing that, I'm also fetching the, the big data. So I'm not utilizing the cache good. So in this example, I would prefer to do either put the big data as a pointer or to do something more like data-oriented design that we are going to talk about it in the, in the next slides, that is putting the big data not in the my data structure and, and access it by having the same indexes. So, um, this is a, a main, uh, something that we will repeat in this talk. Main cache, uh, main, sorry, main memory is slow, not main cache. Uh, cache prefetcher works best when it can predict it, the, the, the access pattern and, uh, and the best practices. Use containers that have continuous memory and no pointer chasing. And uh, we should use almost always vector, and C++23 gives us a flat set and flat map, and there are many libraries that already present that, that as an option. Code is memory too. So everything that we've told about data in data cache is uh, the same for code. So uh, rearrange your branches on a hot path Having uh, branches on a hot path might, might cause the, 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 the CPU to evict uh, the wrong instructions. Uh, don't use uh, virtual pointers on a hot path because pointers are considered to be a cache miss. And if you were on Amir talks about likely and unlikely, that can change the cache behavior, the instruction cache behavior as well. Okay, so let's sum up for now. So small is fast. Uh, locality count, we've spoken about two types of locality, temporal locality and special locality. Uh, predicted, uh, uh, if we can access the data in a predicted way, that's, that's important. And avoid loading into cache what you are not going to use. And if you are going to use something in the future and it's already resides in the cache, so, so try to leave it in the cache if you can. So let's take an object-oriented example. <clears throat> let's take a shape. And this shape can draw and can calculate its area. In order to draw, it needs the color, and there is some kind of a Boolean which is called uh, is visible. Circle, circle is type of a shape. It can draw, but it can draw only if it's visible. And it can calculate an area. To do so, it needs, sorry, a, a geometry, a center, and a radius. Square is about the same. It's drawing when it's visible. It has its area. Uh, it has a top left point and a size. So uh, let's say, how do we use it? We have a vector of unique pointer of shapes. And then we, when we want to draw, we just traverse the shapes and call draw, okay? And how do we calculate its area? We are calculating the total area, so we are calculating each of the shapes area and we are summing that up. So, so let's talk, before we go there, let's talk about the, 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 what is good and what is bad about this program. 
So we are using unique pointers as shapes, right? Unique pointers are bad because a pointer should be considered as a cache miss. We are actually calling a virtual functions, draw and area. And this is something that we shouldn't do in the hot path. Each time that we are drawing, we, are, we, we don't want to draw any, everything. We want to draw only what is really visible. But each time that we are calling the, the, the function draw, we are pulling out of the main memory the all uh, square function in that example just to know if it's visible or not visible. We need one bit of information, but we are populating the cache with the size of square, okay? And more than that, the shapes in the vector are not sorted. And therefore, because they are not sorted, think about when, where we have a lot of shapes, not like in this example where we have two shapes. And the first shape is called draw. Then uh, uh, the instructions are pulled into the instruction cache, right? Now, let's say the second shape, let's call it B, is then calling draw. Then those instructions are pulled into the, into the instruction cache. Now, let's say that we have a C uh, shape. Then this one is called draw, and this one is pulling her instructions to the cache, but it doesn't have space in the cache. So it needs to evict something. Now, let's say that we have another shape that is trying, let's say it's shape A again, that is trying to call draw. But this time, the instruction won't be in the cache. Okay? So when we are calling draw, we actually wanted the shapes in the, in the data structure to be already sorted. So, why is this uh, uh, logic not good enough? Because it's not cache friendly because it calls unique PTR. It wastes cache lines, shapes, because either the instruction cache won't, uh, won't be in the instruction cache when we are calling them. And maybe uh, different uh, shapes will have different sizes and therefore the alignment uh, there will be wasted and therefore it will waste more cache lines. Uh, in the, in the main function, we call the, we call the uh, virtual functions, which are bad. And uh, uh, we actually pulled the, the, the all uh, data even when we didn't need it, even when it wasn't really visible. So let's, let's see, what have we tried to do here? We're trying to draw a shape. We're trying to calculate its area. In order to, to uh, calculate an, uh, the, the area and draw, we need its geometry and color. So let's see how do we handle the geometry. So we could have a circle, which is a point and a, a center and a radius. We have a, a struct geometry, which is top left and the size. And we have shape, shape geometry. And now we are saving them as vectors. We, so we have vector of circles and vector of squares. So to calculate the total area, all we need to do is traverse the circle vector, calculate its area, its geometry for each of them, and sum it up in the result, and do the same for squares. Now, <clears throat> in order to draw this, the shape, I would use a shape ID, which will be an index to the vector, and the kind, if it's a, a circle or, or, or a rectangle. And the visibility will hold, the, the, the shapes renders will hold only the visible shapes. It won't hold both the visible shapes and the, and the invisible shapes. And the pair there contains a, a shape ID and a color. So what do we need to do? We need to take out of the render, if it's visible, we need to, to take its ID and color. If the ID is a circle, then we draw a circle, else we draw a square. So we do have a branch prediction here, the, the if and the else, but from the cache perspective, we've dealt with everything that we've said bad about the, about the object-oriented programming. 
So what do we have here? We group together the data because we have a vector for, uh, for a circle and we have a vector for, uh, for a square. Uh, we implemented the common task, the, the area, not on each element, but on a function. If we need a total area of all shapes, why does each shape need to calculate its own area? We could have a global functions that calculate the shapes. It will have a better cache behavior. And we eliminate the Boolean that, uh, that uh, we've shown before, that uh, if we are visible and not visible. So object-oriented programming is usually called array of structs. And uh, CPU-friendly software are usually using the data-oriented design, the struct of arrays. Um, struct of arrays is more cache-friendly, cache but uh, to be frankly, it's, uh, it's a bit weird to write data-oriented design all the time. There are many reasons why to write an object-oriented uh, design uh, because of readability and other issues. So choose rightly. So what are the guidelines for data? Uh, avoid using pointer types. Pointer types should be considered uh, as, a, as a cache miss. Uh, use as much as you can from the cache line, as we saw in the example of the data-oriented design versus the object-oriented design. Make the data access predictability so that we could, uh, pred we could help the predictor to get the data uh, as we expect, ahead of time. Watch for uh, false sharing in multi-threaded system. There, are, there is something that we didn't talk in this, in this uh, talk at all, uh, algorithms that are called cache oblivious. Cache oblivious algorithms are uh, algorithms that uh, will handle uh, the, the, the cache they will be cache friendly and, and they will use your cache no matter what are the sizes. Like, I don't need to write an algorithm, especially for my machine, okay? They, they will learn it and they will uh, do, do as best as your machine offer them. So what are the guidelines for code, okay? Fit your working set. Avoid iteration over heterogeneous sequence uh, with virtual calls, as we saw in the object-oriented uh, versus the data-oriented uh, design. Fast path, I mean, no branches as much as you can in, in, uh, in a hot path, as much as we can, again. Inline is an interesting point. Usually, inlining a function or inlining something is considered to be good, right? It reduces branching. Uh, it reduces it reduce a call for, for a function. It uh, allows the optimizer to do a better optimization because it sees a bigger picture. But from the cache perspective, it's not considered to be that good because there might be the same code over and over again in your caches. So it's not that efficient. So my tip here, use your inline short and uh, use it with the, with the sense that uh, it might evict your, your uh, instruction cache. Last but not least, uh, there are uh, profile-guided optimization, PGO. The, each of our modernized compilers has a way to instrument your code in a way that after you run it, and you're giving it uh, the, the, the data examples that uh, you should uh, usually use. Then you take that as an input and compile the software again. And there it will be able to predict better about branch prediction and stuff like that and, and take the right approach, the right data into the cache. And last but not least, uh, benchmark everything. All I've said in this, uh, in this talk is, uh, is uh, been carefully uh, profiled so that I can show you the right result and, uh, and show you what I mean. So at the end, profile your software and benchmark it and measure and measure and measure. That's it. So, any question? Could you, could you use code to arrange the uh, circles and squares in 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, he said, uh, if I could use parti uh, stable partitions in order to or stable sort in order to to avoid the the unordered uh, vector that I showed in the object-oriented programming, but it will cost you. Hey, um, yeah, I have a question. Thank, great talk, thank you. Um, so a lot of this advice uh, is kind of traditionally given from a perspective which is focused on x86. Yes. Um, now, especially for like consumer software, like games or audio processing, where all of the stuff is really important, which runs on consumer hardware, ARM is becoming more and more important. Right. So I wonder whether I mean, roughly kind of the hardware architecture is not going to be too different, but I wonder if like, if you look at benchmarks or if you look at kind of the kind of advice that you give, uh, do you have any idea like how much of that changes when you go to, from Intel to ARM and you need to port your software to that? So it really depends. Um, actually, it, the, the, architecture, the architecture didn't change that much, but uh, if you are taking, let's say, a Mac machine, an M1 machine, there, there, there are different things in there. There, there, is, there are, the, the, the way that you're accessing the memory is having other layers that I didn't discuss in this, in this talk, and they influence your, your, the, the, the outcome at the end. So more than that, I don't have anything to, else to add. So if that's it. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. That was, that was excellent. Um, just to kind of extend the last question a little bit, um, instead of going to ARM, I'm going to say, if you're writing high-performance uh, high code, you should be using vectorization. Yes. Or you should be multi-threaded. Or, you know, in my case, I'm, like, porting algorithms to CUDA. So, so my where answer, does this fit in? My answer that? for that would be like that. You utilize your CPU as much as you can, okay? Do uh, SIMD instructions, do whatever you can to utilize your, your CPU as much as you can. But in order to really use all your hardware, it really depends what, what you are doing, but in order to use your hardware today, you have to use parallelism you know, to get to, to do all of the CPUs. I have no experience with the GPUs and CODA, so sorry for that. Yes, I do. You want me to show you? So, I think that's it. Oh, that's the matrix one. So what I've done here, I took uh, two vectors. I made sure that one of them is aligned to 64. <clears throat> and then I took a latch, and in a second you will see why. And I've created two threads that at the, at the end got uh, pointed to my vector. And, and at the end, what we, did, what we did here is that the two threads were aligned to this, to this uh, line because the latches synchronized both of them. And then we access those uh, two, two vectors. We pounded them by read and write modification, each and, and every line, each and every four did the same thing. Uh, and this created the false sharing. And the reason for that is that those were two resources that I knew that I could calculate that they were sitting on the same, uh, on the same cache line. And when running the threads and modifying each of them, I knew that I would create the ping pong effect. The, 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 I would change the, this cache line 
and then uh, this one will be invalidated, and this will be fetched from my memory, and then I would write to this one, and this one will invalidate this one, and so forth. And this will be only two threads. So think about when you, you are increasing the number of threads, you are increasing the colliding between, between the cache lines. There are many examples. Uh, that's a good one with the Herb Sutter showed, uh, showed that uh, uh, when he used an array of integers that he provided to the, to the threads that each of them will calculate a, a subsequence of, uh, of the total uh, sequence, then, then uh, uh, since the, the array itself was sitting on the same, uh, on the same cache line, uh, this behavior occurred and he solved it by uh, using a local variable and then and only then updating the, the, the vector itself. Any other question? Have you uh, any recommendation of uh, stood um, uh, containers? So I guess vector should be the best as the standard says. Yeah. Uh, C plus sub 23 um, would bring flat map. Yeah. Would it be uh, aligned with your talk? Yeah. Flat map and flat set are both adapters of a vector at the end. They are using vector behind the scene. So they ensure you a continuous memory. So everything you need to do, or not everything, or most of the stuff that you need to do, you probably can do it with vector. So. If you, don't, if you don't use vector, you should have a very good reason. Why, why not? Okay, that's it. Thank you.